Bismillah walhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim min hamzihi wa nafkhihi wa nafdhih bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh, today is the fifth lecture of our english series in of series of the tajweed of quran tajweed al quran and uh, inshallah we're going to start with the makharij al huruf uh, with the with the articulation points of the letters of the Arabic language. But before we begin that, the, I want to include, I mean, dedicate this lecture to some introductory things which you should know before we jump into Makhadid. Some terminology, some, some names of uh, different parts of your mouth and your tongue which you should be familiar with before we move on to the Makhadid. Because uh, these things, these names, these terminologies will be repeated many times when we are studying the Makhadid and even the Sifat sometimes. So uh, they, they should be very, uh, you can say, readily available in your memory. So you don't have to think a lot or, or you don't have to open the books again and again when we are studying that. Uh, because if you don't memorize these correctly, then uh, you'll have a lot of difficulty in the coming lecture. So I recommend that you pay close attention to this lecture. So the coming lectures, inshallah, would be much easier for you. So, uh, starting with the letters of the Arabic language, the Arabic language uh, letters are divided into two categories. One of them is called uh, Al Huruf Al Hijaiyah, which are the ones that are actually spoken, and the second one is Al Huruf Al Abjadiyah, which are the ones that are written. So, the ones that are spoken, there are actually 29. The, the words that you speak, that you articulate, they are 29 in total. Uh, they start from uh, Hamza or Alif and they go to uh, Ya. And actually they were they were the first, uh, first uh, person to compile them and uh, to give them a certain order was uh, Al-Imam Nasr ibn Asim Al-Layfi who died in the year 90 uh, Hijri. And he basically gave them uh, an order based on their similarities to each other. And then he also placed the dots on the Arabic letters. Before this, before this, there were no dots on any of the Arabic letters. So there was no way to tell the difference between a ba and a ta and a tha. Or a jim and a ha and a kha. Or a sin or a sheen or a swat or a dwad. There was no way to tell the difference between these because both of these, all these letters uh, that I've uh, that I've discussed or I've uh, read in pairs or in in uh, you can say groups of three, for example, ba ta sa. There was no way to differentiate between them except for the way the word was written and the context in which it was being used. The Arabs of that time were very good in their language; they were experts in the language, so they didn't need these kind of things. And uh, obviously when, uh, when Islam spread and the people started to learn Arabic, there was a need for the ulama to uh, have some way of differentiating these letters from each other. So uh, Imam Nasr ibn Asim, he put the dots on the Arabic letters so people could differentiate between similar letters when they see them. The difference, uh, so uh, just quickly, just reading to those 29 letters, they start from Alif, or you can start from Hamza. Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, Jim, Ha, Kha, Da, Tha, Ra, Za, Sin, Chin, Swad, Bad, Ta, Wa, Ain, Rain, Fa, Qaf, Kaf, Lam, Mim, Nun, Ha, Waw, Hamza, and Ya. The difference between Hamza and Alif is only that an Alif is always Sakin, meaning it has no haraka on it. Whenever the alif has a haraka, then we call it a hamza. So naturally, when it comes in the beginning of a, of a word, in the beginning of a, beginning of a kalima, then it is going to be a hamza. Because if it is in the beginning, it is necessary that you're going to read it with some haraka. And if it is in the end of a word, okay, then it, or, or in the middle of a word, then it is possible that it is alif. Alif meaning there is no harak on it. It is just sakin. Like, uh, for example, bab. The word bab. So the, the word, the, the letter uh, here, between ba and ba, 
is alif. Why? Because it, it is sakin. We read it as bab. And similarly, the word la. So after la, the word that's the letter that's used here, we'll say that it is alif. But if I say, uh, for example, uktub, write, then what I've read in the beginning is not alif, it's hamza, because I just put a dhamma on top of it. I read it as uktub. So everything that starts with a hamza or with an alif is actually a hamza because it is going to have a haraka. And whenever this it does not have a haraka, it is called an alif. That is the difference between an alif and a hamza. One more thing is that uh, since the alif is uh, always sakin and it is going to be always read as a, there is no other way to read an alif except for reading it as a or ba or ta or tha. So one, uh, one thing which we find out from this is that an alif is always preceded by a muftuh letter. Muftuh letter meaning that there is always a fatha before alif. There is no other uh, other haraka that can come before an alif. For example, you never find a word which says ua. Ua. For example, if you say ua, then you're saying u, and then you're saying a, and in a as well, you're reading hamza first, and then you're reading something else. Or for example, you say bua. So in, I mean, you never get these kind of words. You always get a fatha before an alif. Bab. Uh, or, or any other word like this, uh, kaf or kaf, the Arabic kaf, not, not the English kaf. <laughs> so, I mean, you never get uh, anything except for a fatha before the alif. Just just memorize that, just remember that. And the reason is that because there is no, no possible haraka, we don't see any word which has anything before uh, alif, other than the fatha, there is no way to read uh, a mud of alif except when there is a fatha behind it. So it's not possible for any haraka to come. Other than that, other than alif, every letter of the Arabic language can have four different states. Now, one of them is obviously that it will be sakin. For example, ab, an, am, as, ash. The the other three states are when it is mutaharrik. For example, ba, bu, bi. So there are three ways to read ba in when it is mutaharrik, ba, bu, bi. And then the fourth one is when it is sakin, ab. So in total, there are four ways to read every letter of the Arabic language, except for alif, because alif is always sakin. And hamza, of course, hamza, hamza will be only three, because you can't read uh, a hamza. Actually, you can read a hamza as sakin as well, a. You can read it like a. So you can say, except for alif, Every letter has four states, even Hamza, because Hamza can be read sakin as well. Ba, da, sa, ja. So we're reading Hamza as sakin, but you cannot read Alif as anything except for sakin. Uh, now coming to the second category of uh, the, the letters that we discussed, Arabic letters, which is al huruf al abjadiyah, the ones which are written. So in writing, the Hamza and the Alif are actually the same because they're just like a, a straight line. It's uh, If it has a Haraka, it's a Hamza. If it doesn't have a Haraka, it's an Alif. So in writing, they're the same. Therefore, they are only 28 in count. They're not 29. When you read them, they're actually 29. But when you write them, they're actually 28. Uh, if, if you're talking about the, al, the Haruf Abjadiyah, Al Huruf Al Abjadiyah. The ones that are normally written. Uh, there are two different, uh, and, and also their order is not the same. The order is not like Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha. The order is different from this order of uh, Al Huruf Al Hijaiyah. So there are two different orders. Uh, one is the Western style and one is the Eastern style. So without going into more detail on this, uh, just know that the Western style is the one which is adopted by Imam Asha Tabi in his famous poem, Hirzul uh, Amani wa Wajhu Tahani. Al Ma'ruf Al Shatibiyah, which is famously known as Al Shatibiyah, the poem with 1,173 verses, uh, in which he explains all the rules of the Jweed and Qiraat, the the seven uh, famous Qiraat, and uh, he also mentions the differences in the words 
uh, which come which, which we know which we call as the firash or the firash or farsh actually yeah farsh or firash so he discusses the farsh al qiraat and the qawaid al qiraat he discusses all of this in in his poem that the second uh, person to use this and to follow imam shatabi was imam ibn al jazari who is also the author of al muqaddimat al jazariya and another poem on qiraat al muqaddimat al jazariya is basically a poem on tajweed only uh, but obviously tajweed covers all the qiraat and then if you go into different styles of recitation and the, and the different rules which apply to different ways of recitation then he wrote in the poem which was named as at-tayyibatu nashr or tayyibatu nashr uh yeah so in, in that poem he also used this this uh, order of the words um so it it goes like abjad hawaz hutti kalamun sa'fad qarasat thakhadun and dhaghashun so this is the order which is the order of al huruf al abjadiyah if some of you knows urdu you might have noticed that in some urdu books you find that when they are going to number the 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 context of the book uh, the, the the contents sorry the contents of the book when they're going to uh, number the contents of the book they normally don't say alif ba ba ta tha they don't go like this they go like alif ba jim dal ha and so on and i used to wonder that what is the reason of them going so randomly to first alif and then ba and then suddenly jim and then again dal and you know how, how do they make up this order so now i understood that when i found out that there's a there's a separate way of writing the huruf of the arabic language known as al huruf al abjadiya and they have this order and uh, this order is also followed in some urdu books as well so Uh, the way the Imam Shatabi used this basically, how did he use it? He used it to name the the Qurra or the Imams. For example, he started with Imam Nafi who was in Medina. So he gave him Nafi the letter Alif or Hamza. So he said Hamza is Nafi. Then Nafi's two students, uh, Warsh and Qalun. He named them, for example, Ba and Jim. So for example, he said that Ba is going to be Qalun and Jim is going to be Warsh. So now when he's writing his poem if he says if he if he wants to mention uh warsh or qalun he will not say he will not write qalun like this he will just write jim so the reader knows that this jim is referring to warsh and if he wants to mention nafia he will just write hamza so the reader knows that this hamza is referring to nafia so this is the way he uh, this is the this is why he used this uh this way of uh, representing the the qurra and the aimmatul qurra aimmatul qira'ah so he could uh, shorten his poem and it was easier for people to memorize it moving forward um the arabic language when we when we study the makharij of in in terms of tajweed we will we will say that there are five main articulation points five main articulation points the first one is jawf okay jawf means basically uh, you, your you can say belly but in this case uh, what we're what we're uh, referring to is the empty space in your mouth and in your throat and specifically the the mouth the empty space in your mouth so that will be known as jawf then uh, it will be your halq halq will be your throat then your lisan which is your tongue then shafatan which is your uh, which is your lips and uh, which are your lips and uh, then khayshum khayshum is the trunk of your nose or actually to be to be precise the space behind the trunk of your nose that is known as khayshum the empty space be- behind the trunk of your nose that is khayshum where there where there is air and um, you 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 pronounce the ghunna an um from that place so these are the five main articulation points uh, but these five can be further summarized in four main articulation points uh, if you talk about the makharij which are the main makharij of of the arabic letters al makharij al raisiyah lil huruf al arabiyah so the main are only four first one is 
Al-Jawf. And Al-Jawf includes two further things. Uh, it includes the empty space of the mouth and the empty space of the throat, both of them. Then it's your Al-Halq. Al-Halq is obviously your throat. Then is your Al-Fam. Al-Fam has four different places. First one is Al-Hanuk Al-A'la. Al-Hanuk Al-A'la is the top roof of your, the roof of your, of your mouth, of the inside of your mouth. Uh, so you have your tongue and there is a place below your tongue and then there is a space above your tongue. So the, the roof of your mouth from the inside that is known as Al-Hanuk Al-A'la. Then the second thing which is included in the fum, your mouth, is Al-Lisan, which is your tongue. It is a part of your mouth. Then Al-Asnan, your teeth, they're also a part of your mouth. And the last uh, but not the least, it's Al-Shafatan, which are your lips. Then uh, the fourth main makhraj is Al-Khayshum. Al-Khayshum, I already explained to you what it is. So quickly, the four main points of articulation are of the Arabic uh, Arabic letters in general, not to, not specifically talking about Tajweed, but in general, there are four. al jawf which includes the empty space of your mouth and your throat, then your throat, Al-Halq, then your mouth, Al-Fam, Al-Fam includes four different places, al hanuk Al-A'la, the roof of your of your mouth from inside, uh, then Al-Lisan, which is your tongue, Al-Asnan, which are your teeth, Al-Shafatan, which are your lips, and Al-Khayshum, which is the empty space behind the trunk of your nose. Moving on, uh, let's quickly just see what each of these parts are further divided into. So coming to first of all, Al-Halq. Al-Halq is divided into three different parts. If you start from the place where your tongue is, is connected to your mouth, you can say the root of your tongue, just behind the root of your tongue, the empty space just behind the root of your tongue, that is known as Adna al-halq. Adna actually means the lower part or, or the, the, you can say something which is less. So, but here we are actually talking about the, if you, if you look at a person, the you see that the topmost part of, your, of his throat is the one which is closest to the tongue, right? Or the closest to, the, to your teeth or the exit point. But when we talk about, about uh, pronouncing a word, we see that the voice actually starts from inside, right? And it comes towards the outside. So whatever is in this order from inside to outside, we name the one that's coming before as the one that is on the top or the aqsa and the one that is coming after as the bottom one or the adna. Uh, uh, so that's why we named this, I mean, the ulama have named the, the, the topmost part of the halq which we see, I mean, which we see from, I mean, if you're staring at a person, the topmost part of his throat will be adna al-halq, meaning the lowest part of his throat. Uh, below that, just just above or just equal to your uh, your uh, uh, your windpipe, you will have wasat al-halq. So wasat al-halq is just, you can say, below your area of your, uh, the root of your tongue, but just slightly above your windpipe. And if you talk about the area which is just at the opening of your windpipe or, or the area slightly below it, I mean, just from the opening to slightly below it, that area is known as Aqsa Al-Halq. So from Aqsa Al-Halq, you get two voices of Hamza and Ha, A, Ha. And then from the wasat al-halq, you get two more voices, uh, sound, which is of ayn and ha. And then from the very top of your throat, which is known as adna al-halq, you get two more sounds, which are ghayn and kha. We'll go into the details of this when we go to the makharij, inshallah ta'ala. Moving forward, the hanakul a'la, uh, al-hanakul a'la, it has different parts. So starting from the, from your teeth, the place where your teeth are connected to the skin of your mouth, that is known as al-litha. So the skin which is just beside your teeth, that is known as al-litha. Then the rough portion of your roof, of your mouth's roof, which you feel, if you start moving your tongue from your teeth and, and keep moving your tongue behind towards your throat, you'll feel that there's just, just besides your teeth, there's a rough patch 
of uh, of skin on the top of your mouth that is known as muqaddam uh, al muqaddam al the 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 part of the hanak which is uh, you can say forward and then you uh, move towards the back of your hanak and you get the hard part i mean this one is rough first it's rough then it becomes smooth but it's still very hard right if you move your tongue you'll you'll feel that so the hard part of your of your mouth's roof or your of your hanak is known as al hanak al azmi azmi with ain wa mim and ya mushaddada so al hanak al azmi is the hard part of your al hanak and then the if you keep moving your tongue you'll feel that this hard part finishes and a soft part of your uh, of your mouth's roof it starts the the soft part so we name the soft part as al hanak al lahmi al hanak al lahmi meaning laham literally means uh, meat so since this portion is meaty portion i mean it seems without a bone or something it's very soft so we name it, name it as al hanak al azmi then if you move further behind you will see that a piece of flesh is hanging uh, on our uh, on our uh, in, i mean in our mouths and we name that as the laha al laha or if you want to want to say it in urdu it's lahat so there's the marbuta i mean around the at the end of this word so in, in in arabic you're going to read it as alha these are the different parts of al hanak so alitha then muqaddam al hanak then al hanak al azmi and al hanak al lahmi and then finally alha so five different parts of al hanak moving on to the tongue the different parts of the tongue as well so the first part of the tongue which is connected to your mouth is known as jazr al lisan meaning the root of the tongue after the root of the tongue the the first part that comes immediately after that immediately after the root of the tongue it's aqsa al lisan aqsa al lisan then after that the middle portion of the tongue is known as wasat al lisan after the middle portion before the tip of the tongue that is known as tarf al lisan and after tarf al lisan the the final tip of the tongue is known as ra's al lisan ra's means the head so the head of the tongue is just the tip of the tongue you can say then the sides of the tongue are also named and they are named as hafatul lisan and hafatul lisan again has three portions the one which is besides uh, which is beside aqsa al lisan that is known as aqsa al hafa and the one that is beside wasat al lisan that is known as adna al hafa and the one which is beside tarf al lisan it is known as muntaha al hafa so al hafa which is the side of the tongue is further divided into three categories aqsa al hafa adna al hafa and muntaha al hafa aqsa al hafa adna al hafa muntaha al hafa the one which is beside aqsa al lisan that is aqsa al hafa beside wasat al lisan and tarf al lisan is adna hafa al hafa and besides ra's al lisan just beside the tip of the tongue on the left and the right you have uh, so these are the three different uh, you can say uh, points of the tongue's side now moving forward you have your teeth and now the human mouth has a pair of uh, teeth which is similar on the top and on the bottom of course and there are 16 teeth on the top and 16 in the bottom so 16 pairs of teeth you have in total in your mouth total 32 teeth they're divided into different names according to their function and in, in uh, uh, the words and pronouncing the words and also their uh, their differences between each other so the first pair is athanaya athanaya there are four teeth two of them on the top and the two of them uh, and the two the remaining two at the bottom uh, they are known as Athanaya al uliya if they're on the top and Athanaya al sufla if they're on the bottom. Uh, moving beside the Athanaya, 
there the two teeth which are besides your center two teeth they are known as arba'iyat so there are two on the top and two on the left uh, two on the bottom then moving forward your sharp teeth which are like uh, pointy teeth they're known as al anyab so al anyab are your pointy teeth then moving on you have al lawahik al lawahik is the start of your molar teeth that is the first uh you can say um first uh molar teeth which starts after your your pointy teeth i don't know the the technical names of the teeth in english so i, I think some of them are canine or some i don't know i don't know what they're called to be honest so i'll just uh try to explain in simple words what i can so uh besides your pointy teeth you have two pairs of uh, teeth on the top and two uh, sorry, one pair of te pe uh, teeth on the top and one pair at the bottom. That is known as al-lawahik. These are your molar teeth which have only two uh, pointy, pointy tips. Then moving on, there are three sets of uh, teeth, molar teeth on the top and three sets at the bottom. So meaning six on the top and six at the bottom. These 12 uh, molar teeth are known as al-tawahin. Al-tawahin. And then the last one of uh, your teeth, two on the top and two at the bottom, they're known as an nawajid And uh, we get this word nawajid in a hadith as well. When the Prophet ﷺ said that, hold on to, uh, to uh, my sunnah. I think it, it's something like, hold on to my sunnah at the end of times with your nawajid Meaning with your molar teeth. I mean, for, hold on to it firmly. Don't let go of the, Allah's book and the sunnah. So uh, these are the names of the teeth. I'll just go through them very quickly. Athanaya, the two on the top and the two on the bottom. The front two teeth on the top and the bottom. Arba'iyat, the, the teeth beside the front two teeth. Two on the top, two on the bottom. al anyab the pointy teeth. Two on the top, two on the bottom. al lawahik your first molar teeth with two, two pointy tips. Two on the top and two on the bottom. Then your main molar teeth. Six on the top, six on the bottom, at tawahin And lastly, an nawajis your last uh, molar teeth, two on the top and two on the bottom. Uh, an nawajis are the teeth from where we get our wisdom tooth, the last one. So these are our um, teeth. Moving forward, we have the definition of a sound. What is known as a sound? Sound is something which is a disturbance in the waves of the ear or the, or the wind or the, you can say, yeah, you can, you can say ear. The disturbance in the ear which is heard by the human ears. So we're talking about the, the voice which we are going to discuss in the Dweed. So a voice over here refers to a disturbance in the ear which is heard by the human ears. Now the human ears, as we have studied in science, can hear from a frequency of 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. Anything below 20, we cannot hear it, and anything above 20, we cannot hear it as well. So uh, you must have seen that there are some, some dog whistles. Uh, so these dog whistles, they actually have a frequency of above 20,000. When you, when you blow a dog whistle, you cannot hear it because the frequency is above 20,000. But a dog's ear, a dog's ear is able to hear. A dog's ear is able to hear a frequency of about twenty thousand. So when you blow that whistle, you cannot hear it. The humans cannot hear it, but a dog can. So therefore, he responds to that. That's uh, some something scientific which uh, you find in common life. Now, how is the sound produced when we talk practically uh, or naturally? How do we see sound being produced? We see sound being produced when two things collide with each other. We also see when we when we break something or we tear something, a sound is produced. Similarly, when something is vibrating, like the buzzing of a bee, uh, when they're in group, you can actually hear the buzzing sound. So that's just a vibration, but but it's it's collectively you can you can hear the vibration. Even if, for example, if you take a steel uh, f ruler or steel scale and you you put it one 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 portion of it on the table and you vibrate the other one, you can actually hear the vibration. And then if you rub two things together, for example, you're cutting something, cutting wood with a, with a saw 
or you're cutting uh, some apple with knife, something like this. You can actually hear the sound because both surfaces are colliding with each other. You're rubbing the surfaces against each other. So these are some different ways which we see sound being produced in which we see or hear actually sound being produced in the natural world. Uh, these kind of topics are, are discussed uh, normally by people who are uh, interested in ilm al the, the the knowledge of sound. How is sound actually produced? What are the vocal points of your of your mouth and how, how I mean of your throat? How uh, can you change the points of uh, of um, uh, you, you can say producing the sound? How how can you produce a heavy sound? How can you produce a, a, a shrill or a sound something like this? So uh, some scholars in the past, like Sibuway, they were interested in not just uh, they were experts, sorry, in not just one one of the things. They were expert in many fields at the same time. For example, Sibuway, he was an expert in Nahav. At the same time, he was he was an expert in other fields of the Arabic language and also in in how the sound is produced from the mouth. So he discussed such things in his book Al Kitab. It's a very uh, difficult book to read. I haven't read it, of course, because it's above my level. But he has discussed such things in his book. And uh, then the ulama of Tajweed, then uh, who wrote some books in the in the middle, you can say. Uh, era of Islam, they did not discuss such things because it was not directly related to Tajweed. They focused on the rules and and the and the things which are related to uh, producing the sound from your mouth, practically. But they didn't discuss such things. But then now you see that the ulama these days they're including such things in the books as well, because uh, now we have modern technology where we can actually see what's inside a person's mouth. So they draw pictures and they tell you the exact points from where the sound is being produced and they, they have to discuss some portion of the science of uh, how a sound is produced as well. So people have a better understanding. Plus, I mean, people are generally more educated about science these days than they are about their religion. So uh, in, in this way, they can help people understand what they're trying to explain. Uh, moving on, we see that um, we are going to discuss the huruf. So for that, we need to understand what is a harf, harf in the Arabic language uh, when we talk about tajweed. So what is a harf according to, the, the, according to tajweed? A harf is a sound. It's a sawt which is produced from a makhraj which is either muhaqqaq or muqaddar. Now, I'm not going to translate some of the words uh, over here because, as, as I said before, these are some terminologies which you need to memorize in Arabic because some terminologies, you cannot explain them in English. Even if you can, they lose their true essence. So it's better to just recognize them as they are in Arabic. You, you memorize the terminologies as they are because they're going to be repeated so many times when we study the Makharij. So if you don't memorize them in the Arabic language, you, you if you make some own... Uh, some of your own uh, uh, of your own ways of memorization in English language, maybe they will be helpful for you in in some cases, but in most of the cases you will be stuck because you'll have to go through the Arabic definition again and again and again to see what that word means. Anyway, I recommend in Arabic, but if English is easy for you, you can go for some English translation as well. I don't mind that. So a harf in the Arabic, uh, in, in terms of Tajweed, is a sound which is produced from an articula articulation point which is either muhaqqaq or muqaddar. Muhaqqaq, as we know, is something which is specific, it, which, is, is, which has a specific point. So, a muhaqqaq makhraj, a definition of that is that from the points of articulation, from the halq and the lisan and the shifatan, if the voice stops at a specific point of articulation from the articulation points of al-halq, lisan, and shafatan, then that makhraj is known as makhraj muhaqqaq or al-makhraj al-muhaqqaq. So again, I'll repeat that. If the voice, if the voice stops on a particular particular articulation point from the articulation points of halq, lisan, and shafatan, then we say that that makhraj is muhaqqaq. Then coming forward is the makhraj which is muqaddar. 
So naturally, it will be quite opposite to this. So if your voice does not stop at a specific articulation point from the articulation points of halq, lisan, or shafatan, then you will say that this makhraj is not muhaqqaq, but it is muqaddar. An example of makhraj muqaddar is the huruf al maddiya Huruf al maddi wal lean. So huruf al maddi wal lean, which are a, u, e, collectively in the in the kalima y. So wow, which has a madmum letter before it, creating the sound u, and alif, which has a maftuh before it, creating the sound a, and a ya, which has a maksur before it, creating the sound e. So these are the three different uh, huruf. Huruf al mad. And they are uh, pronounced from the makhraj muqaddar, not from muhaqqaq. Because when you say there's no there's no place where the sound is stopping, right? There's no specific point where the sound goes and stops. The sound actually stops either when you cut your breath or when you run off your, run out of your breath and you have to eventually stop. So you can keep saying uh, ooh, e, and never stop until your breath runs out. So there is no point, specific point of articulation for these sounds. Therefore, their makhraj is muqaddar, not muhaqqaq. So the, the ways to recite or, or to pronounce a sakin harf is that two articulation points have to be brought close to each other. So for example, let's say, take the example of your lips. So your lips are far apart, and then you bring them close together, and you touch the lips together, and it makes the sound um or ab. So when you touch your lips together, it made the sound um ab. Now how about you take your lips apart from each other when they're actually touching each other. So you'll say ma or ba. So these sounds get produced when you are taking your lips far apart and when you bring your lips or any two articulation points together, for example, at, ab, as, ash. So we find that the, the second huruf, all of them, they are pronounced when you bring two articulation points close to each other. And the mutaharrik, uh, mutaharrik, Huruf, for example, ba, bu, bi, ta, tu, ti, sa, su, si. They are pronounced when you actually take apart, or, or or you you create distance between two joined articulation points. Ba, ta, sa, i, ji, he, like this. Then the huruf al madde wal lin. Uh, as I told you before, there wow before it is a madmum harf. And then alif before it is a maftur harf, and alif is always preceded by a maftur harf as, as 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 we mentioned before, and then ya which has a maksur before it. When you say alif, a, uh, you notice that you have to open your mouth. Okay, you have to open your mouth, and your tongue is in a resting position. That's the first thing. These these are, these are two things which happen when you are pronouncing alif, alif al mad. So you say a, uh, so. There's um, there there's opening of the mouth. That's one thing, and then your tongue is in a state of rest. That's the second thing. Coming forward to u, u. When you say u, your mouth has to be in the shape of a whistle. When when you are trying to blow a whistle, like u, it has to be completely round. Your lips has have to be completely round when you're trying to pronounce wow. Either that wow is متحرك. A mutahadik or that wow is uh, maddiya sakin. So you will say u. So you have to make uh, like like uh, a round face, round shape of your lips in order to pronounce wow correctly. And uh, second thing that happens in this naturally, it happens naturally, is that the top, uh, the, the last portion of your tongue reaches towards the top. Okay. If you notice that, when you say oo, oo, it is not possible to rest your tongue like it was resting in a. Uh. So because in a, uh, you opened your mouth. But in oo, you have to actually close your mouth. Uh, 
So when you when you're closing your mouth and you're making a round shape from your lips, ooh, ooh, ooh. Naturally, your tongue from the behind, from from its root, uh, from the aqsa lisan area, it goes towards the top. Then you're reciting the last one of huruf al madhiyulin, which is ya. So when you're reciting ya, then um, the two things again. First of all, with your lips, and the second one with your tongue. So with the lips, they are taken further apart, and uh, I mean not not further apart. You can say they are expanded. The lower lip, especially, is expanded. Expanded in a way that you are smiling, for example. So let's suppose you um, are about to smile. You will say e e, just like just like you smile, e e e e e. And notice one more thing, that first thing is your lips, they, uh, obviously, um, the lower lip, it will be like when you're smiling, that's one thing. The second thing is that the middle portion of your tongue, it will go to the top of your mouth. So the middle portion of your tongue, it will go towards the Al-Hanak Al-Adna. Al-Hanak Al-Adna. Uh, sorry, al hanakul a'la. I completely misread that. Sorry, I I completely misspelled, misread that. Actually, I didn't even read. I don't know why I read that as al hanakul adna. It will go towards al hanakul a'la. Sorry. <laughs> so the middle portion of your tongue, it will go towards al hanak al a'la. And uh, what's remaining in this? Actually, there's there's a lot of information. I'm I'm trying to just give you what is necessary for you. Some of the things I, I have to skip because if you keep discussing in, in detail, then there's uh, it's, it's just going to be a waste of your time. Not not these things are not for now. Some of these things. So I guess this is pretty much it, which I want to discuss in the introductory lecture for the Makharij of, of the Arabic language. Mm, yeah. So inshallah from the next time, we will study the Makharij al-Huruf of the Arabic language, specifically in terms of Tajweed. And uh, again, my advice to you all will be keep practice, practicing. If you're not sending your audios to me, which none of you are, by the way. So just keep practicing with the Shaykh and uh, keep memorizing the Arabic terms. They will benefit you a lot in the long term. Keep memorizing them and if possible, start teaching to someone you know who does not know that with that all what you learn here you 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 mean there's no uh, limit to the, to learning and to teaching but what you did what you must teach you must know it properly so when you're when you're sure that you know a topic very well you in order to uh, keep it in your memory for a longer period of time it's better to just teach it to someone even if you can if you don't find someone just read it out to yourself from your memory just just pretend that you are your own student and read it out to yourself Inshallah, I believe it will be very beneficial because when you're teaching, it's necessary that you go through your lesson again yourself first. And there are many points that uh, open up uh, by, by the grace of Allah when you're learning something uh, in order to teach it to other people. So this is just a small advice from me. And uh, may Allah accept what, uh, whatever you're doing and give us ikhlas uh, in everything. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلق محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين